So, this is a incredible moment, a cool moment, an important moment, a fascinating moment. My good friend, the great social psychologist, Alan Langer, neighbor where I live in South Parkland, Massachusetts, is here with me, and she is going to talk about what may be the most important book that I've come across in a long, long time. And that may sound like hyperbole, but it is not. Uh, the book is The Mindful Body, subtitle, Thinking Our Way to Chronic Health. That's an innocent sentence, which is not innocent. When you open the book and read a couple of pages, one of the first things you read is, I believe our psychology may be the most important determinant of our health. That's strong language. Basically, Ellen dishes, disses, trashes, throws the entire medical system out as we have today and tells us we're doing it about 180 degrees wrong. Isn't that fair? Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't say throw out the medical yeah. knowledge, but I do think that people are oblivious to how much control we have over right. our health. Yeah. And the medical world knows they don't know. And that's the, the secret that they keep. You, know, you really think they, they know? Well, and all <laughs> if, if they read the book, they'll know. <laughs> no, they, no, they read the book, they'll know. They that's the, that's the point. It'll right. change everything. Now, all um, experiments only give us probabilities, right. maybes, right? So if you were to do the experiment again, exactly the same way, you're likely to get the same finding. That's translated as absolutes. Yeah. And um, so, and they know that uh, maybe it's not so true, not true all the time. Let me tell you, Tom, my life changed years ago. I was at this horse event, and this man asked me, can I watch his horse because he's going to give his horse a hug. I'm hardly the old old horse here. Nobody knows better than I, as well, but not better. Horses don't eat me. He came back with the hot dog and the horse ate which made me realize that virtually everything I thought I knew could be wrong. Now, people might feel you know, nervous about that. To me, it was very exciting because it opened up all sorts of possibilities, yeah. some of which I've explored and described in this book. I think, that, I think that's absolutely fabulous. Well, the thing, I want you to give us a couple of incredible stories. Sure. And, and maybe along the way, well, yeah. I want you to give us a couple of incredible stories that are infinitely powerful and that will turn people on and make, make them understand. I mean, this book oh, is man. so freaking important. Thank you, Tom. I, I, I'll give you a couple of stories. I'm yeah. trying to evaluate my stories. Yeah, no, no, no. Is this the right one? No, fun, but, fun yeah. awesome, incredible. Okay. okay, so let me start. A lot of the book is about mind, body, mood. These are just words, mind and body, and they hold us up. I say, put them back together. And if you put it back together, mind and body, it's one thing. Then wherever you put the mind, you're necessarily putting the body. And you can put the mind in all sorts of places, some of which I do. How did this happen? I had an experience when I was young. I was married when I was very young. We went to um, Paris for our honeymoon. Now, being young, I had to be a woman of the world. Right? I was, what, 19 going on 40. And I ordered a mixed grill. And one of the items on the plate was a pancreas. So I asked my then husband, which of the pancreas that one? So, okay. I ate, I'm a big eater, as you know. And I ate everything with gusto. Now comes the moment of decision. I have to eat it because, after all, I'm now so sophisticated and now a woman. I started eating it, and I'm getting sick, really sick, literally. He starts laughing. I said, What's so funny? He said, That's chicken. You were at the pancreas ages ago. <laughs> I love it. So, uh, so how did that happen? Yeah. How did I get sick? I mean, I'm yeah. eating chicken. I yeah, love yeah. chicken. Fast forward, um, a more serious example of mind body related. My mother had breast cancer that had metastasized to her pancreas. As you know, that's the end goal. Yeah. Right. And magically, it was gone. The medical world couldn't explain it, but the mind body unity idea does explain it. And so then we've done lots of studies. The very first test. Let's go was, back to the chicken with that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's a It's an absolutely wonderful story. It's a shocking story if you tear it apart one more at a time. Spend a couple more, more time. A little, um, little more time. I mean, yeah, you know, I chew. What the hell is going on in the mind and this well, connection you're talking about? Okay. Physiologically ill. Right. Because for me, 
the pancreas is something that's going to make me nauseous. Right. And so I eat thinking that it's a pancreas yeah. and the nausea just right. uh, just but the, without yeah. any choice. And you're obviously wrong about the first proposition because you ate the real pancreas. That well, that, exactly, yeah. exactly. Thanks yeah. for making me feel like you're doing that this whole time we're talking now. Um, Okay, so the, the, the first study I did, um, I can say this is a film study, only because um, if you turn it, tune into The Simpsons Go to Havana, they actually detail the story and the study. It's the counterclockwise study. So we retrofitted a retreat for 20 years earlier and had elderly men live there as if they were in the younger study. Lots of ways. So they would be discussing the past, for example, in the present tense. So Give me an example. Uh, no. Um, so they were talking, they had a conversation about Khrushchev. Okay. And it would be as if it was happening now, uh, rather than in the It past. looks like Khrushchev is exactly. going to. That's the present tense. Yeah. It's much better to say that. Okay. And so um, so they spend a week um, being their younger selves. In only a week, we found their vision improved, their hearing improved, their strength improved, their memory improved. And they look noticeably younger. Truth be told, they've been there 20 years now, but still noticeably younger, all without medical intervention. And so that was the first, I did that a long time ago. And now in the Mindful Body, I detail um, all of the newer studies, which are as dramatic. Let's stick with that wonderful, wonderful one. Tell, tell me what's going on. How does it, what's your explanation for what happened? Well, I think that people, you know, when we're young, Many of us buy into the mindset that when you get older, you're going to fall apart. Right. You know, I mean, a simple example that if you're 20 years old and you hurt your wrist, you fix your wrist, right? You, you know, bandage, you exercise, whatever you're going to do. You're 80 years old and you hurt your wrist. What the hell? I mean, um, 80 years old, I'm supposed to fall apart. Yeah. So you don't take those steps. Yeah. All right. There are so many things that we can do that uh, we don't do in terms of our health, our well being, our successes. Um, because of these mindsets that say, when you're old, you get it. So everybody makes mistakes. Everybody is, quote, incompetent some of the time. And when you're younger, you know, okay, so I made a mistake, and you go forward. When you're older, ah. You know, so if you forget something at 20, you forgot it. You forget it at 75, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be coming, um, you know, senile. Right? No, it's not. Let's not go down that path. won't go down that Thank path. you. Uh, but I, I must tell you and everybody else that I teach, and you know I teach Harvard students, the creme de la creme, I give an exam, and believe me, they forget. <laughs> you don't have to be old to forget. Anyway, so, um, so what happens is our mindsets stop us from uh, making changes, from even beginning activities in the first place. So these old men... You know, when they showed up to be in the study, their adult children, daughters usually, brought them to the lab. And, you know, you talk to them, and the daughter answers, you know, the doddering. I mean, they're really in bad shape. In fact, at one point, I said to myself, what am I getting into? Tom, yeah. I was young myself when I did this. I didn't realize what I was, you know, what an undertaker to be. I was going to be responsible for these eight old men, all by myself, every aspect of their lives for a week. Anyway. Um, so, um, what happens is um, they feel that they can't, you know, that they're worthless, basically, right. that they're, you know, the end game is right around the corner. Once they and, uh, came to the study, a very funny thing happened with the comparison here. So, I'm on the bus uh, taking the men to the retreat. Now, I, this is many, many years ago. It was before Google, if anybody can remember. Really? So, <laughs> even, even to have the music playing from the past was a major feat. Now you just yeah, you know, sure. say, play music from the past or Lexus or from whoever. Um, and um, as we're getting closer to the retreat, I realize, oh my goodness, my graduate students, my male graduate postdocs are not with me. Here I am with eight big suitcases. That's all I was thinking. We get off the bus and I just announced to them, oh, I'm not carrying your suitcases. Yeah. You know, you you can move them an inch at a time to take them up to your room, unpack them a shirt at a time. Well, you can imagine how enormously different this was from all the tender loving but over care they were getting at home. So they're you know thrown into an environment where the rules are you're your younger selves, they have to make their own meals, they're um, supportive of each other, and um, 
it didn't occur to them, I think, to question, can I do it? Yeah. You know, they were just doing it. And as a result, we got all of these improvements. And I think that the, the major takeaway from the study is that we can never know that we can. And actually, you can't with experiments prove that you can. All you can prove is that what you tried didn't work. So try something else. Yeah. You know, uh, but the results were phenomenal. And so, um, but uh, the next version of this, which is several years later, was a study that we did with chambermaids. This is fun. So first we asked chambermaids, how much exercise are you doing? Now they're working all day long. Right. You would think, they say they're not getting exercise because they think exercise, according to a surgeon general, is what you do after work. And after work, they're too tired. Yeah. Okay. Now, if they're um, exercising, you would think they'd be healthier if exercise is good for them than people who are socioeconomically equivalent, who are not exercising all day. Turns out they're not. Now the experiment, very simple. Two groups. One group who said, your work is exercise. <laughs> they show them um, you know, pictures of working at, um, at being on the gym, you know, working on this machine is like making a bed and so on. And so 20 minutes later, they're all persuaded, gee, my work is exercise. Yeah. We've taken many measures before we start the study, and then the measures at the end, this group is not eating more or less than they were before. They're not working any harder. As far as we could tell, the only difference was now they see their work as exercise. They lost weight. There was a change in waist to hip ratio, body mass index, and their blood pressure came down. Now, just, I would love to have you say exactly what you just said and even slow it down further. Right? That is a, a face value. I know that all of my colleagues are watching it incredibly brilliant. <laughs> so, I mean, I, for Christ's sakes, I'm 80 years old. I studied this stuff for 50 years myself. I read that that silly thing, and the only, there was only one appropriate reaction. Holy shit. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, that's yeah, the yeah. power of what you're yeah. doing. And so yeah. stick with them. Say, what the hell is going on? Yeah, um, well, I know you're implicitly asking me to give you the um, biology, the neuroscience of it. And for me, once we say mind and body is yep. one, um, I don't care. There's always something, you know, kind of like yeah. this. And um, my um, biology is different, physiology is different than if I don't go like that. Everything is happening, but one isn't leading to the other. Right. They're happening more or less simultaneously. Yeah. And so if you buy that when you exercise, you're going to be healthier. When you exercise, you're going to lose weight. And now you see yourself as exercising, you will lose weight. Yeah. And that, you know. But uh, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's it's, a it's wild. profound slash powerful slash wild, like crazy, like, yeah. what the hell is this woman thinking? Yeah, I don't I mean, know where just, these things yeah. come from. Yeah. Okay. So, no, no, no. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, I, I've read many of your studies and complex studies. And that is so trivial, and yet one of the 10 most non trivial things I've ever okay. heard. Thank you, Ben. Well, so let me give you the most recent. There okay. are many, many of these studies uh, reported in the book. Which, you know, in and, the and, then you're, and then you're going to tell me at some point, you tell me the most recent one, and then you're going to tell me how do we get this into the day to day healthcare system, which, you know, I know from some of my own research that just well, I'm expecting it will take over. And that no, I'm not, no, 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 no. All, all I mean is, is trivial stuff. Yeah. Like no, I once think nurses sure. started carrying sure. tablets, their eye-to-eye -eye contact with the patients went down by 75%, yeah. and eye-to-eye -eye contact is healing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I think, well, let me... Give me the new experiment. Maybe we'll you, both forget that. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you about the most recent experiment. All right. Excuse me, so uh, we inflict a wound. Now, it would have been more dramatic if I could really hurt the person. Yeah. I don't want to hurt the person. And even if I did, the review board was not going to work. <laughs> for good, for good yeah. So it's a minor wound, but a wound nonetheless. And what we do is we have three groups, each individual one. So there you are with your wound, and you're in front of a clock. For a third of the people, the clock is going twice as fast as real time. For a third of the people, the clock is going half as fast as real time. For a third of the people, it's real time. The question I'm asking 
interesting is does that one heal based on real time, which is what everybody would presume, or perceived time, which would be the time they say on the clock? I and know it. And I the know it. I don't know what to do with Jake. Jake, well, <laughs> keep going. And what happens is that wound heals based on perceived time. In a similar way, you know, it must be bizarre. Once I start dealing with clocks that are real time, I have lots of clock studies, but one of them, yeah, people in well, sleep well. I mean, that's just. It's that's the same thing with sleep well. They wake up, they see the clock, they think they got two hours more sleep than they got, two hours fewer, or the amount of sleep they got. Their biological and cognitive yeah. functioning follow perceived sleep. Our beliefs are so important, and most of us haven't the biggest notion. Yeah, but what I want to know is your story here, the research, is so important to health, health care, and it's really great that you and I are having this conversation. But it's a, it's, I'm, yeah. I'm not prone to horrible exaggeration, but it's a world flipper. You know, I mean, you know, exactly. literally speed speed the clock up, and suddenly, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this very soon because I take a blood thinner, and that means anything I touch turns to a big bruise, and now I'm gonna make the bruises go away. Well, but, but you have to believe, you see, but I if know. you think, ah, oh, this is a rig clock, yeah. like, I don't. There's yeah, some no. people who set their alarm, yeah. you know, to go up uh, five minutes sooner or five you know, and then it actually is. Uh, and it may be because they groggy that when they see, oh, it's eight or seven, whenever they're trying to get up, they get up and then realize they have extra time. But what but, what are the implications in a, in a, for health care? For health care. You know, what if, if you had, well, I was going to say 20 CEOs, but if you, health care CEOs, but they'd all have <coughs> NDAs, they wouldn't be listening anyway. If you had, well, let's take the people who really do the healing, the head nurses. Um, if you had a room with 30 or 40, what would you tell them? What would you, what would you, how, what would be the behavioral change that you would yeah. suggest? Yeah, well, it probably be the sorts of things that you also write about, you know, that um, life is a people game in a sense, right. and that people matter, and they matter to everything, to the success of the business, uh, to the success of their own health, and if the nurses approach their patients mindfully, and I'll have to explain what that means in a moment, not only will the patient heal faster, but the nurse's health will be improved. So in the mindfulness, as we study it now for over four decades. This is, that's great. This is yeah. exactly where I want okay. you to go. Um, is it, it's so simple, like Tom, it almost defies belief. It's just noticing new things. When you notice new things about the things you thought you knew, you realize, gee, you didn't know it. Yeah. And then your attention naturally goes to it. So as you're noticing new things, the neurons are firing, and the research over all this time has shown that it's literally and figuratively enlightened. So the question is, why don't we notice? Yeah, and I, that's just, I'm going to interrupt this a little bit, the research here. Yeah, so the, the neuropsych, we've got this in hard data. Yeah. That something yeah, you're, different is going on. Oh yes, we inside. have a hard that that we make people actively notice and yeah. they live longer. Yeah. And I have that across three different investments. Yeah, but I mean relative to the, the third level down. Yeah, yeah, I don't tend to take those measures, but okay. it would be hard to imagine how somebody could live longer without yeah. something yeah. something changing internally. Um okay. Well, what was I saying? Um Oh, oh, about, yeah. So, uh, I'm, yeah. Uh, okay. Now, so it's not just this act of noticing. You might ask, or it is just this act of noticing, but why don't people notice? And that's because they think they know. And that when you think you know, you don't tune in. And what happens is all of this research has made clear to me that virtually all of us are mindless almost all the time. We're not there. The problem is when you're not there, you're not there to know you're not. Right. Yeah. And so if you start, yeah, well, if you recognize that everything is always changing, everything looks different from a different perspective, you can never know. You don't know, I don't know, nobody knows. And if you recognize that you don't know, then you sit up and you pay attention. And you know, the important thing is that when you're not there being mindless, um, the body is slowing itself down, you know, you're dying. Um, uh, literally and figuratively. You know, I think that even if you're brushing your teeth, be there for it. 
you know, and for me, I make everything a game. So um, I'm always a happy camper. And the, the point of that that's probably important to mention is to be mindful. It doesn't require any effort. In fact, it's energy you get it. When you're having a good time, you're being mindful. You can't have a good time without being mindful. If you did a crossword puzzle and you remember all the answers, and then you're going to do it again. Not so fun, right? right? Uh, but the first time you do it, if you like crossword puzzles and stuff. Anyway, the point is that um, everything we think we know, as an example, I gave you the horses running. Here, here's one for you, Tom. How much is one in that? Two, Ellen. Really. Okay, thank you for implying. I know that we have the book and we know the right answer. But you're as sweet as that. And you're I was a math pro. And that's and probably, right, right, so, which is why we're, we're friends and we're talking about it. All right. But most people mindlessly say one and one is two. In fact, I think this is probably the one fact that they're most certain of. But one and one yeah. isn't always two. I'm going to appeal to your being a, a math person. <laughs> That one and one is two if you're using the base 10 number system. If you're using the base two number system, one plus one is really 10. Now, most people have no idea. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I didn't no, feel no. either, so. Yeah, no, bingo, you're yeah. right. A, a funny story, apropos of absolutely nothing. Uh, my stepson is um, a professor of math. And I said, and I had in one large lecture I was teaching these math majors. And I said, Brett, tell me something that I just swore at him. And so he told me about transcendental numbers, which you know, I don't really understand, but I threw nice, it out. Nice and I did almost fall off the page. Just totally. So, but even the math majors and even people like yourself who know different number systems or you know, different answers right. still think that within a base 10, one plus one is two. It's always been two. It'll always be two. Well, it's not. If you add one cloud plus one cloud, one plus one is one. You had one wad of chewing gum plus one wad of chewing gum is one. You had one pile of laundry plus one pile of laundry, one plus one. In the real world, one plus one probably doesn't equal two, as yeah. of often as it does. The point being that we don't know. And not knowing is good because nobody knows, so you're not less smart than okay, somebody so else. Okay, so I'm going back to this room with you and 20 head nurses. Right, back to the nurses. So right. we're going to go back. You've got them. You've done a little whatever. They are people who are receptive, uh, who God bless them down deep, really want to heal the yeah. people they come in contact. What the hell are you going to tell them? How is how can they be at their job in their hospital sure. and provide it? What do you, well, what do you want them to do? There are so many things. Once they realize they don't know and the diagnoses, uh, may be wrong in any particular case, that then they approach the patient differently. And they ask different kinds of questions. Such and they as, engage the person. Such as? Um, um, you know, I, I'm, well, uh, I'm trying to think of the various diseases that, that I have. Uh, Okay, so it, you know we've done uh, research that I, you know, I would share with them, and I'll share it with you and um, the people who are listening to this on attention to symptom variability. But so let's say the uh, nurse will ask the the person with the broken leg, "How does it feel today?" Yep. And if the person with the broken leg says, "Right now it's fine," chances are the nurse, prior to learning about any of this work, will just that's good. And yeah. just go about their business. Yeah. But there's an opportunity yeah, that they would, that's what they I would be about. missing. Okay, so um, essentially, we, we have this program of uh, teaching people to attend to subtle changes. When you have, and I call it attention to symptom variability, just a fancy word for being mindful, noticing change. Okay, so let's say uh, you have chronic pain. And I call you and I say, So, Tom, how do you feel right now? And is it better or worse than the last time we spoke? And why? That's the crucial question. All right, so three things happen. By your noticing that, gee, it changes. Because when, you, when we have chronic illnesses, almost all of us believe the symptoms are going to stay the same or get worse. Tomorrow will be the same as today. Yeah, or, or worse. worse. Right, and exactly. nothing moves in only one direction. So by calling you to see, and at some point it's going to click where now it's a little better. Mm -hmm. Hey. So you immediately feel, gee, maybe I don't have to feel 
terrible all the time. Mm -hmm. By searching for why, you're doing a mindful search, right? You're thinking about things that you hadn't thought of before. That itself, as you said, is good for your health. And I believe that if you believe they're the solution, you're much better, uh, much more likely yeah. to find it than just assuming. You know, and people don't understand that chronic just means the medical world hasn't figured out you know, a cure. It doesn't mean right. there is no cure. And also on a, on a separate note, um, uh, it, it, it just seems to me intuitive that if you make the body as strong as you can make it, then you're going to be stronger in the face of any illness. You know, so that if your arm is broken um, and in a, such a way that they don't have to fix your arm, um, but the rest of your body now is in top shape, chances are your arm will heal faster than if you just assume it's going to take forever yeah, yeah, yeah. and, um, you know, and sit and watch television all day. And I like television, yeah. but, um, you know, sit and watch television and eating chocolate and I like chocolate, but still not, you know, 24 seven. Yeah. So the nurse now hears that, hey, right now it feels a little better. Yeah. And then what she would ask or he would ask is, why, what's happening? What's yeah. different right yeah. now? And together they could figure this puzzle out. Or you know, so, at the very least they'd be paying attention. Exactly. To and, and, so well. Yeah, and because they're now engaged in a meaningful conversation, that's good for the patient's health, but it's also good for the nurse's health. You know, burnout is a very big problem in healthcare. Yeah. Um, and burnout results mostly from the doctors and nursing giving and giving and giving as if they have nothing to take. And um, once they recognize that they really don't know, then everything becomes potentially more interesting. And um, you get a, a, a reduction, I think a significant reduction in burnout. But so for this, uh, to make this attention to variability clear, because it's, I, I think it's really an important yeah. concept, let's imagine that you're stressed. Okay, now people, there are some people who think they're stressed all the time. No one with them is anything all the time. Okay, so we call you periodically, and how are you feeling now? And is it better or worse than before? More or less stress, and why? And you go through this over a week, over two weeks, and then you discover, Tom, because you paid attention and done this, that you're maximally stressed when you're talking to only one. Okay, then the cure is simple: don't talk to me, or talk to me differently. Yeah. Okay, but interestingly, you will get better even if you can't figure out because you're being you're more mindful. Paying attention. Because uh, to new things, yeah. you're actively yeah. noticing. Uh, so that's just one of the many ways it would happen. I, if I ruled the world, yeah, I would make it essential. In fact, in the mindful body, I present a, a new kind of hospital. Um, that good. if we had these, right. I think like, people yeah, we need would would not be. What's, um, what's it, what? Well, first of Tell all, me about it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, you know, hospitals are supposed to cure us. Anybody who walks into a hospital becomes stressed. Beyond belief. Well, right. you know, it's funny. I'll just interrupt you a little bit. Uh, I sometimes go to Mass General for something, mm -hmm. and I've done well, but I don't have a billion dollars. Like some people, I said, if I had a billion dollars, I would give Mass General a big hunk of money, but only for one thing: changing the reception room. Yeah. Because when I, yeah. I said you walk into the reception room, mm -hmm. and if just walking into the room does not make you feel shittier. Exactly. And, 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 no, I, well, because the thing is, yeah, it's so. Yeah. <laughs> what people don't realize is that being stressed is not just uncomfortable. I believe, and I don't have data for this, um, I tried to gather it, just too hard, but that uh, stress is the major culprit for virtually all disease. So yeah. if we took people, 100 people who are each diagnosed with some dread cancer, the same cancer, yeah. as soon as you get that diagnosis, no one's going to be happy. However, if we follow them up three yeah. weeks later and then every few weeks or a month, uh, I think that that degree of stress over and above nutrition, genetics, and the medication yeah. would determine the outcome. Yeah, very much. And my, so, my training was good enough that I just buy that 100% yeah. with about period 100 zero. Yeah. yeah. So you go to the hospital and now. The first thing that happens is you're going to be more stressed. Well, it's funny because you just think, oh, again, what do they call it? Uh, 
There's a whole group working on this. I can't remember the name of it right now. It doesn't matter anyway. But they to undo that, they do such things as send ahead of time to the person who's checking in the hospital a little map. Here's where you park. This is where you go. This is how you go. It's just a, no. That's it, nice. It's every single except that it's still the case that um, you walk in and it feels like a hospital. So whether yeah. you're going to the right yeah, or the yeah. left. Yeah, right. no, no, no. Be no, what I mean, what right. I mean is, it starts you, and they do all that too. Yeah. But they, you know, it was years and years ago. Uh, Disney gave parking lot attendants good uniforms. Yeah. And it yeah. was just to change the entire attitude of the person who. Well, yeah, and and so you know you can read that, or people if they're interested can read that in the book. But the main thing is that our entire. Um, uh, system of anything, education, business, uh, needs an infusion of this mindfulness. Yeah. That right now, what's happening is people try to solve today's problems with yesterday's solutions, yeah. and um, they're not working. And uh, but I want to talk a little bit more if you'll let me about stress. Of course. You'll let me. Okay. Yes. 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 So, I'll, yes. So yes. yes, yes I yes, love you. Because you know, as we said now, so stress. Is really bad for your health. Okay, and really stress right. is psychological. Okay, so we can control that. I have a one liner that our mutual friend Eva, every time she sees her, she thanks me for sharing this with her. Um, ask yourself next time you're stressed, is it a tragedy or an inconvenience? It's almost never a tragedy. Like, oh my god, I burnt the meat. Oh my god, I'm late for the meeting. Oh my god, I didn't turn in the, the project description on time. Whatever it is. Um, you know that, and as soon as you ask them, you say, "Yeah, all right." So it's not good, but not the so world, terrible. The not exactly. Yeah. Then yeah. you can relax. Now, stress requires uh, two things. The first is the belief that something's going to happen, and second, that when it happens, it's going to be awful. Okay, so let's mm -hmm. unpack that. People don't realize that prediction is an illusion. You cannot predict. Do you not believe me? Okay, so let's say no, 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 but but people no, they're going to argue with us. Yeah. Okay, so um, if I give you um, you have a hundred Mercedes, and now you're going to try to start them each, and you have a hundred jalopies, and we say which is more likely to start when you first turn the key? Okay, the Mercedes. But that's group data. If I say to you, would you wager your entire life savings that? Any particular Mercedes would start. No, 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 no. We can't predict the individual case. And that's really all we care yeah. about, especially yeah. when we're dealing with our health. Okay, so um, we are wonderful at looking back and making everything make sense. And we can't going forward. So I think it was Kierkegaard who said, we live our lives going forward. We understand that looking back, the Monday morning quarterback. An example that I've used too often, it's not great, but it's top of mind for what I keep saying. So you see Tom and, excuse me, not Tom. Um, we'll have Bernie and Sue. No, I don't want to say Susan, Tom's yes. wife. <clears throat> we'll say Bernie and Alice are fighting. Bernie and Alice. And they're fighting, and they're at a party and they're fighting. So if somebody said to you, you, know, you think uh, they're going to get divorced, you say, no, people fight. Okay. But if nobody asked you, and the next week you said, ah, Bernie and Alice are getting, I knew it. You should have seen them go with each other. Okay. So we think we can predict yeah, the end, but yeah, we yeah. can't. Okay. So you're stressed. You think something is going to happen. The first thing is give yourself three, five reasons it might not happen. So you be immediately become less certain it's going to happen and then more relaxed. Now's the hard part. Let's assume it does happen. How is that actually a good thing? And what people don't realize is that the good and bad of everything is in our heads. Events don't cause stress. Our views of events cause stress. Mm -hmm. And if we're more mindful, so we have many potential views. You know, somebody snubs you. Was it because they were shy? Was it because they don't like you? And many, you know, and you can choose the explanation that feels good. All right. So you go from this terrible thing is definitely going to happen and you can't sleep at night, and you're very stressed, causing yourself potential illness. Or it may or may not happen, and whatever happens, I'll make it an advantage. So I, you know, for me, I love when somebody is supposed to do something for me, and they can't do it. You know, why? Because then they feel so bad. <laughs> but 
they're going to do something bigger. <laughs> and, you know, and it's fine. And also, you know, if um, you know you, you arrange this for us to speak today, if we couldn't speak today, we'd speak some other day. Um, and I would spend my time, you know, with my grandkids who are leaving tomorrow. So it'd be a good day. You know that if people recognize all we have are moments, and you make, and it's easy to make a moment matter, and you yeah. make the moment matter, and then your life is, you know, all taken care of. And stress, I mean, I almost never experience stress. I, I think that people don't have to, you know, that there's a way of, as I said, calling up. You know, so somebody bangs into my car. Oh, okay, so I get the car fixed, the bang, and then I fix something else. Yeah, yeah. But then I fix something else that needed to be fixed. And wow, it's a good thing the car was banged because now, um, you know, it's just uh, totally better. Yeah, no, I, I love that because it's kind of my view of life. Only, only, only the moment matters. Right. That's a good right. concluding point for this conversation. It, I think it's been fantastic, and I just hope that, and I hope that everybody on earth buys this damn book, and particularly every medical profession, but everybody else too. It, it's an it's an amazing, and I know you well enough to know, which is really kind of annoying, you never open your damn mouth unless you've got 73 research studies to prove that what you're saying is there. And so, you know, there's not not a not a not an untested word uh, between the two covers. So, can I have the last word? Yes, of course. Oh, so of course how could you can. say no, especially on film? Okay. <laughs> um I think that when people accept the mind-body unity idea. And then you realize that every thought you have is not just an opportunity, but every negative thought is hurting you. Um, that people, if they follow the simple things that I described in the book and take it all seriously, the way you so nicely do and have suggested that people do, they'll realize that it's not just your health that we can control, but it's every moment of our lives. Yeah. It's our, our happiness, our well-being, our relationships. You know, in the early work on mindfulness, what we find is that the simple process of actively noticing results in more life, uh, better relationships, um, and even leaves its imprint in the things that we do. And it's easy. It's what we're doing. We're having fun. So I can't see why anybody who yeah. can understand this wouldn't change their lives. It's really, it's, it's really funny because... You know, I get to have conversations like this because I wrote a book four years ago with a whole lot of people bought from in search of excellence. And I became the excellence guy. Well, the thing, the term that I use, I think it's just a ditto, is that excellence is not an aspiration. Excellence is not a hill to climb. Excellence is the next five minutes or it's nothing at all. Perfect. Yes, that's perfect. And I think that's, that's, that's exactly right. And I, and I feel that so yeah. passionately. Yeah. Well, Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for your time, your energy. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you for the 8,372 experiments that <laughs> you, which you made it through to get from hither to thither and so on. And I thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah.